the same one. Hi, hi, hi. You are not very clear. I think I'm not sure. There's too much echo going on. I think. Yeah. So I, I think I take my mask out. So probably you can hear me. Okay. Can you see me and, and hear our voice? Yes. It's this is uh, quite clear. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, are we ready to start or uh, do, are we waiting for anybody else? Yeah, I think we are ready to start and uh, uh, because there's a echo, uh, right? The sound? Yeah. Is, is uh, Prof. Jacob here as well? Yes, yes. I'm Jacob here. Excellent. All right. Uh, in that case, I think uh, we won't waste too much time. Uh, yeah. our, our participants have already, uh, uh, our speakers are already here in the chat. So uh, I will start the uh, session today. Uh, I'm uh, SU Professor Vairavan. I'm the Deputy Head of the International Unit for Faculty of Medicine. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome all of you all to our, our bi-monthly, two-monthly uh, Changung and uh, University of Malaya uh, webinar series. Uh, I think today we are very uh, grateful to have uh, Professor Jacob uh, Sitong Pang, uh, who is also the Vice Superintendent of uh, Changung Memorial Hospital uh, and a very uh, 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 very prominent uh, uh, clinician uh, researcher as well as a good friend of uh, University of Malaya for many, many years. So thank you, Prof, for joining us today. Uh, with us in uh, uh, the University of Malaya side, I've got uh, Prof uh, Professor Gosidu, who is uh, going to chair the session on my side, uh, on our side, as well as uh, Assistant Professor uh, Mohamed Nahar Azmi, who is our sports physician, uh, who will be giving his uh, talk, who will be sharing his talk. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I hope we have a good learning experience today. Uh, Prof Jacob, you want to say a few words? Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and really, uh, really nice to see all our good friends from University Mayor. And uh, because after, after uh, last year, uh, we, we've been uh, working together and try to bring our team together and do a lot of good discussion. So I'm, I'm very appreciate that uh, uh, colleagues from uh, University of Malaya are willing to continue uh, this kind of uh, interaction and collaboration. Hopefully, uh, looking forward, uh, I hope that uh, uh, we are not uh, seeing each other or, or discussing things to, uh, online. Uh, hopefully, in the near future, we can meet up uh, somewhere in Malaysia or in Taiwan. So, uh, I'm really looking forward that uh, we can strengthen our relationship, uh, especially once the uh, uh, border is open up uh, we we should arrange uh, more uh, uh, close and physical meeting together so uh, just uh, in short i hope that uh, today's meeting go uh, well and we can know each other better especially in sport medicine uh, thank you for the expert and also our expert from kaohsiung Med uh, changgen memorial hospital together and uh, i wish everyone uh, have a good uh, learning time and and Stay healthy. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, Prof. I think uh, I will uh, hand over to the uh, my chair of the session, uh, SA Professor Gosilu, and uh, she will uh, start the session. Thank you, uh, Prof. Ayravan, for the kind introduction and uh, starting the session when we start the ball rolling. I am uh, Dr. Gosili from a sports medicine unit. I am a sports physician by training. Um, I am also a lecturer in the University of Malaya as well as associate prof um, in the department. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone and also uh, I would say I'm very pleased and very uh, honoured to be able to introduce uh, the first speaker for today who is our head of department as well and he is one of the pioneering group of students for our um, sports medicine program in Malaysia. Um, Without further ado, I would like to welcome um, Associate Professor Dr. Mohamed Naha Asni Mohamed to start his talk to introduce to you how our specialty started in Malaysia about 20 years ago. Um, uh, to you, Prof. Thank you. Um, go. Uh, first of all, a uh, very good afternoon to everybody, uh, everyone, Prof. Jacob, and the rest of uh, speakers from uh, Changgung Taiwan University. 
um, um, it's my pleasure, great pleasure, um, to get involved in this uh, series of webinar between two universities, uh, which uh, which actually I'm very very uh, honoured to convey uh, to spread out the news what is actually happening here in UMC Malaya. So um, I'm Mohamed Nahazmi Mohamed, um, a sport physician, um, um, head of department uh, for sport medicine since uh, um, 20, uh, 2012, so almost 10 years now, uh, due to step down soon. Um, I would like a great opportunity to introduce to everybody our specialty. Uh, uh, we are basically a physician, a sports physician by train. So we have our own program, which is actually the only in the country at the moment. So we are the first and the only uh, uh, university which produce a sport medicine uh, specialist uh, for the country. So we have started this uh, much earlier. So let me proceed. So uh, what I'm going to tell you later on in between about 20 to 25 minutes uh, is about uh, sport medicine in, 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 in your simulator. layer. So the background history, uh, the journey begins, uh, sport medicine residency training, then the evolution of sport medicine services in New Simlayer. And then I will touch a little bit in terms of one of our uh, most recent uh, on, uh, ongoing um, uh, service and also part of uh, research that we are uh, start, started, started with collaboration with other discipline in this, uh, this university. So it started in 19 uh, for the Commonwealth game, but the initial uh, project has started at, uh, already begin uh, since 1991. So it's meant for um, Commonwealth game. So the reason to have this because we don't have any proper so-called uh, training in producing sport position in the country. So that's where the initial idea started. So to provide, of course, a center of a uh, center of uh, uh, to produce a lot of sport physician in the country, and um, that's when it begin. So these are the important. She is an important person in in our life of a sport medicine. Even though she is a sport physician, uh, uh, Professor uh, Zaliha Omar. Um, uh, she's a, a rehab physician by train. Um, she's been in your steam layer since the very, uh, since 1970s. Um, then she initiated this, uh, program of, uh, sport medicine and rehab medicine together, um, uh, start in 1997. So the first batch, I'm not the first batch, but I'm the third batch, but the first batch started in 1997 where the, actual uh, sport medicine residency training program and also rehab medicine residency program started uh, and established in 1997. That's where it begins. Initially, we are together with uh, rehab medicine, but uh, then in 2003, we departed from rehab and we stand alone. Uh, and at the same time, we also been recognized as a, a special specialist uh, from uh, the specialty body, National uh, Specialty Registry in 2003. So uh, I would like to uh, give a bit of introduction about our residency training program, which is actually a four years training program. Uh, it has gone through a lot of uh, ev uh, evolution since it started at the very beginning in 1997. So a lot of uh, improvement uh, has taken place and until today, uh, we managed to get uh, uh, involved with the National Curriculum Review to establish uh, a, a new curriculum. So basically, what I'm presenting now is actually our uh, so a curriculum is an integrated uh, program. So it's a four years training, uh, uh, residency training program. At the moment, uh, it's in-house, which is actually in the University Malaya itself, um, Faculty of Medicine, and at the hospital, University Malaya Medical Center. But of course, in future, uh, in view of um, uh, increasing numbers of applicants to join sport medicine, so we may have uh, 
uh, uh, uh, satellite set, uh, center where world train sport medicine uh, trainees. Uh, at the moment, uh, no no other universities in the country that involved in the training program. But hopefully soon, because uh, quite a number of um, uh, candidates from other university has been trained from here. So hopefully we will have uh, more uh, uh, training centers that can produce more sport physician for the country. At the moment, we still numbers are a bit at the lower end compared to other specialty, but hope it's increasing uh, gradually. So we have uh, four years training, uh, where the first year is basically uh, in regards with uh, basic sciences. So they have to pass their part one examination before they can proceed to uh, final uh, training, uh, what we call that, uh, years until they completed year four of training and uh, uh, and then uh, proceed for the uh, final examination. So basically, uh, these are what we call that the module uh, in the syllabus. We have quite a number of module there. So it's everything is anti-integrated, not solely uh, sport medicine in general, but also a component from other discipline, which may uh, contribute in terms of enhancing uh, knowledge and also uh, uh, what we call that uh, important uh, input in terms of uh, treating not only athletes but public in general which involve in physical activity exercise or any form of um, uh, a sporting or exercise activity but even uh, in terms of prescribing uh, exercise for patients that uh, uh, in terms of preventing from uh, non communicable non communicable disease diseases, so which you can see that lot of uh, uh, involvement from other disciplines, so exposure for our candidates to get um, in depth in terms of uh, as much uh, uh, important knowledge for them to uh, bring them um, confidently uh, out as a sport physician later on one, once they pass the program. So this basically uh, the type of uh, assessment that we uh, do to the candidates uh, if, uh, in, in view of the numbers of um, staff, uh, academic staff, um, so we couldn't uh, take so much, uh, so too many uh, candidates. So there's a number of restrictions that we have to um, to really need to look after. Otherwise, uh, it's not the quality that come out will be uh, jeopardized. So, uh, so we have stage one, which is actually the part one, and then later on, uh, uh, final exam. Yeah. So these are the are the component that we assess them throughout the session. So these are the essential learning activities. So I just give a bit of a summary, not in detail in terms of what we are doing uh, 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 to all the candidates uh, when they are going through throughout the years of their learning uh, process and uh, and uh, under supervision in terms of what are, are the procedures that they require to perform during uh, the session. Even uh, we have a special, uh, 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 what we call that, um, uh, good collaboration with our sports orthopedic side. So we are working alongside where we were anything that uh, uh, we identified, we may need to diagnose then uh, at least or any individual that required for intervention, we will communicate uh, very well with our uh, uh, colleagues uh, from uh, sports orthopedic. So now coming back to uh, the services itself. So this is when we first started 1997. We are very small in a small room. Uh, we only have few cubicles and then everybody crammed in a small area where that's where we get together. And at the same time, that's where we, we see patients yeah, for all sorts of patients. I will explain later on what are the services that we are giving to the community uh, public. Um, in terms of our, um, uh, well, in, which involve in our expertise. And then later on from 2012 onwards, where we move to a new building, uh, where a bit 
slightly bigger, much bigger. Uh, we have more consultation room and we have quite facilities where we, assisting us to provide services to the uh, public around uh, Kuala Lumpur in general, but also we do receive referral from other uh, patients from other states. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also get involved in research where most of them, of course, in terms of uh, sport medicine, um, uh, uh, generic sport medicine uh, research, but other form of collaboration with other dis disciplines also. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, what we call that, get involved with. So this, uh, that the new building where not new now, it's only 10, no, almost 10 years. So we started actively involved in research for the past, I would say, more than five years. Okay, uh, right. So these are the services that we offer to public uh, and uh, in terms of um, communication, uh, collaboration with other discipline in the hospital. Um, the two main, um, uh, what we call that, bulk of service, one, sport medicine, injuries prevention and management. So any form of injuries, uh, early detection, pre-participation, injuries, uh, treatment and rehabilitation uh, involved in this uh, big chunk of component. So, of course, uh, some of us involve uh, closely with uh, doping and most, almost most of us involve in medical protection service or medical coverage for a various uh, range of national or international sporting uh, event in collaboration with uh, National Sport Institute and other, other organizations which require us to get involved with their event. The other chunk, big chunk of uh, our services is basically fitness and exercise medicine, where we prescribe in general uh, in terms of prescription of exercises to all sorts of uh, most non-communicable diseases, um, obesity, uh, OE, uh, children, even uh, elder, elderly population uh, and cancer survivors. We uh, Recent, we um, do uh, collaborate with a uh, surgical department in terms of um, pre-operative assessment uh, patient before operation. So we involve uh, our uh, equipment, uh, cardioprogram assess test as part of the tool to perform uh, risk uh, stratification pre-operatively so um, to make some kind of uh, added um, information for the surgeon and for the anesthetist to uh, decide uh, what will be best for the patients or uh, to get an outcome, a good outcome out of that uh, 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 operation. Okay, so um, of course we do also fitness assessment in general, a uh, few uh, um, tools that we have in the uh, department, in the clinic. And also, we, we are fortunate we have a um, um, uh, sports uh, dietitian that also coming in the system. So, which where we have uh, a team which includes um, uh, physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, uh, and also uh, a sports dietitian involved in uh, managing patients in our setting. So these are the team, who are the teams uh, of the sport medicine. So we have around 10 of us, eight uh, uh, academics. Uh, so at the same time, you are a sport physician by train. And we have two clinicians. So you can see uh, each one of us have their own niches, yeah, uh, which they are focused on. Maybe we can think about um, some kind of uh, working together in future, looking at uh, various uh, niche area which each one of us uh, uh, have their own uh, so-called ex expertise. So there are eight of us, uh, 10 of us. Eight are 
the eight are the academics from the academics, and the two are purely cl clinicians. So these are, this is actually um, the things that uh, one of the services that we have in uh, our, our setting, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. Initially, we started to uh, perform uh, fitness assessment for athletes, for individual, individual who wanted to get involved to become fit, uh, either they are by themselves or they want to get involved in any form of um, act, uh, exercise or physical activity so we will do perform this when we first started this in 2009 but uh, intensively we start promoting this uh, from 2011 onwards from 2018 uh, december onwards uh, we start to uh, work together with surgery department especially colorectal uh, uh, team and vascular team uh, with anesthetists uh, performing this what we call pre-operative assessment and conditioning for patient uh, prior to their operation. So most of the patients at the moment are from colorectal team and vascular. So vascular team usually will refer um, very straightforward. They would like to know uh, the status of the patients uh, prior to the uh, operation. So that's where they will decide whether to do open or uh, endoscopic, endoscopically. So this is the flow where we first started, colorectal uh, team. Uh, we have uh, our first, in, first initial discussion uh, unofficially. So they, we started with a project. This basically is a, our so-called um, um, uh, cohort uh, or a pilot uh, project. At the same time, you are collecting data. We're still collecting data till today. Um, um, we have numbers of patients from colorectal team. Um, and we actually uh, managed to collect, collect and uh, try our best to publish the first uh, half of the cohort, even though it's not completed yet, uh, uh, in terms of the findings that we have done so far uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in assessing preoperative to ensure how much the outcomes after we have done this assessment and the outcome of the operation after we have done the assessment. So of course, uh, the objective of that is to uh, stratify each patient who comes to our uh, uh, assessment. So when we were referred from these two, uh, either from colorectal or from um, uh, vascular team, so we will assess whether patient really fit or not to perform. If yes, we will proceed. If not, we will have another protocol. We which we will assess them uh, as a baseline, and then we will have a discussion with our team, uh, especially for colorectal. And most of the time, they will have a time frame where maybe patient will have time to perform a conditioning. So that's where we will do another assessment later on and perform. Uh, a test, a CPAP test, if let's say they fit enough. But at, at times when after the test done, if let's say they fit to perform a CPAP test, but if the test is not sufficient, we still will have a discussion with the surgeon and with uh, to decide whether uh, or not uh, what's their plan for this patient, if patient have time for conditioning, we proceed. If not, then they will decide whether what type of procedure they want to perform to the patients. So basically, this is what we do when after patients uh, eligible to proceed for the test. So we'll prepare the patients uh, and uh, and then what the things they need to get ready and they want to avoid uh, before the test uh, performed to them. And then type of protocol that we use, of course, for patients, uh, we use uh, a re, uh, what we call that uh, recumbent uh, bicycle as their tool for testing their endurance with a protocol of REM protocol. So these are a uh, number of uh, parameters that we are, we are looking at after performing the test. And they, 
uh, consider uh, the test um, success. So they need to achieve. So of course, most some some uh, most of the time for patients, um, of course, uh, those are quite not in a good shape. So they are unable to achieve uh, uh, what we call even uh, the least uh, effort to uh, tell that the, the test is actually sufficient. Uh, then we will uh, get uh, reported the uh, get get it reported and inform the um, uh, the, uh, surgeon which the, their patient's results and what they need to do next. Uh, if they require to perform conditioning, they will refer it back to us and we will perform that accordingly. So, of course, when looking at patients, we will start uh, a, a program which is actually suitable for patients and start very gradual and looking at that. And by the given time, uh, we will reassess again and see how much it has improved or maybe not improved at all then then if that's the time frame that uh, have uh, achieved and then patients still not able to achieve the minimum list of uh, effort or uh, results then the decision have to make uh, then uh, the surgeon will make a decision to which uh, procedure they need to proceed so of course these are one uh, out of that parameters that we're looking at uh, when we perform the test. So we are looking at the anaerobic threshold. So we use this as a guide. Of course, it's not uh, what we call that. Um, uh, we need to look at patients as a whole in terms of uh, their progress. And, and then we will give um, uh, other uh, re relevant results from the test and given to the uh, surgeon and the anesthetist what uh, they think about the, uh, the, the, the status of the patients before making any decision uh, what's next for the patients. So as a guide, that's why uh, one of it that we're looking at the uh, parameters that we use uh, is uh, anaerobic threshold. So, this is where the category that may give some idea what to expect if, let's say, uh, surgery need to perform for the patients and what are the possible outcome and what they need to expect in terms of later on after operation and, and where patients uh, need to go uh, immediately after the operation. So this is actually just uh, a guide. Uh, in the end, is, uh, uh, at, at, at the time where the operation done and the condition of the patient there on the table after the operation, that, that's where uh, both the surgeon and the, 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 the what we call that, the anesthetist will decide where to go. So another, uh, what we call that guide, which uh, uh, a way of uh, assessing uh, out of the parameters that uh, uh, achieved by patients, uh, after the test, so which way patient will go if, let's say, they need to go for operation despite with uh, quite uh, not in a good shape of results. So for those patients that uh, required uh, further uh, interventions, uh, this is what we offer uh, in between if, let's say, either uh, they were not fit to perform the CPAT or they managed to perform the CPAT but the results is not sufficient and then surgeons uh, still have a time frame allowed uh, patients to proceed for conditioning. So this is where uh, we will play our role in trying to assist patients to uh, improve their um, health well-being as much as possible and as fit as they could prior to the operations. So in a way, we try to uh, uh, make it uh, better chances for the patients yeah, to improve as much and regain as much their functions yeah, uh, later on after they have managed to perform conditioning and once there is uh, uh, operation done and to expect that uh, a, a better results and better outcome out of this uh, process 
of that operations. So definitely uh, an important um, uh, collaboration and discussion between uh, the surgeon, the anesthetist and our team is uh, to set a goal of what we would like to achieve for these patients and then what are at the beginning, what are the so-called uh, limitation from the patients that maybe we need to anticipate in terms of uh, the outcome or the uh, aim or objective or perhaps the goal at the end of the process of conditioning that we would like to give to the patients. So in the end, we would like to prepare patients physically, ment mentally, and they look uh, before the operation and after operation and leaving to the, uh, leave the hospital uh, with very few uh, complications. So it will be effective when we implement this uh, as much as what we have seen. I didn't show the results uh, of what we have done so far uh, from our uh, first half of our uh, collection of uh, data until to 20, end of 2020, but we're still continuing our data until today, uh, continuing from what we have already achieved until 2020, until now. So far, the uh, results were very promising. So hopefully we'll get uh, uh, much better uh, numbers and uh, results uh, and outcomes out of that uh, uh, cohort. So in view of guide, uh, when we perform our conditioning or program. So this is where uh, at least, so we need to get involved as early as possible once the surgeon start to identify patient at the very beginning uh, before making, uh, before decide, decide to, let's say, if let's say patient's suitable for uh, conditioning at the, uh, at the very beginning. So that's where it's important rather than uh, finally decided to do CPAT and then no, uh, what we call that um, time uh, or, or sufficient time to perform if let's say the results not that good and then required conditioning. So as early as, as soon as possible once they identified. So in the discussion, we agree that uh, uh, the, the, from the surgeon uh, colorectal team, they will try to get us involved. So as much we will get uh, to uh, get patients come in and started gradually and slowly and try to get them as much fit as possible prior to the operations. So I think that's all from uh, us. Uh, it's actually one of the um, services that we have and also one of uh, the research area that uh, uh, is ongoing that we are doing, we we have quite a number of uh, uh, services that uh, involve with a quite a number of research uh, that uh, we may maybe we can get uh, uh, together and discuss further in future. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you so much. Uh, I get uh, sent back to Dr. Uh, Associate Professor. Dr. Ku for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Naha. That was an interesting talk to highlight what we are doing. Um, I think it sets a very good background and scene for the next two speakers who are from the Orthopedic Surgical Department of Chongkong Medical Memorial Hospital. Um, the next speaker would be uh, Assistant Prof. Kwan Ting Wu who has been serving the Chenggong Memorial Hospital Orthopedic Surgery Department since 2012. He is also serving as a football team doctor for the Chinese Taipei men and women's football team. Um, his talk today would be about trauma and sports-related elbow injuries. Um, without further ado, um, please uh, welcome Assistant Professor Wu. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. So I'm Dr. Wu from Kaohsiung Sanke Memorial Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about the trauma and sports related elbow injuries. And I will focus on the arthroscopic treatment of these kind of injuries. So 
first of all, I would like to introduce the basic anatomy of our elbow joint. In our human body, we have six types of different joints that execute different functions. And the elbow joint belongs to a hinge type joint. It's more like a hinge on a door, allowing our bones to move in one direction, back and forth with limited range of motions. And the elbow consists of bony structures and soft tissue structures that provide stability. For the bony structures, we have distal humerus with capitalin and trochlea. And the distally, we have the radial head and olecranon. For the soft tissue structures, we have lateral collateral ligament complex on the lateral elbow and medial collateral ligament on the medial elbow. And owing to these structures, we can do a full extension of elbow with 150 degree flexion and rotation with almost 90 degree spination and 90 degree pronation. But actually, we don't need a full range of motion in our daily life. We only need a flexion extension arc around 30 to 130 degree rotation with uh, almost 50 degree pronation and 50 degree spination for functional elbow range of motion. So we can execute our daily activities like bring our cell phone to ear or playing a keyboard. And so the first topic will be the traumatic elbow injuries. And I will introduce the elbow dislocations because I think this is the most important, most difficult part to treat. And an elbow dislocation can be simply divided into a simple elbow dislocation and a complex dislocation. So about the biomechanics of the elbow, of an elbow dislocation, it, is com it usually comes from an extra loading. In this video, it demonstrated a football player sustained a fall with his arm landing on the ground. And we can see a great deformity of his elbow joint with dislocation. So as we see in the video, we can see the position of our forearm beside different injury pattern of, of our elbow dislocation. The most common one is the postulator rotatory stress with our forearm in supination position and a bulbous elbow and with an extra compression load. So the first, diso first disrupted structure will be the lateral anaglateral ligament and then the force goes to the anterior part and finally the medial part. So I will introduce the simple dislocation first a simple dislocation means a dislocated elbow joint without any bony fractures. And so this case is a 25 years old male with a dislocated elbow joint. And initially we have to take care of patient's neurovascular function around the elbow joint. And after initial evaluation, we can try to do a close reduction at emergency room. So we can put a patient on a prone position with forearm hanging over the table and we apply a traction force on the forearm, then we try to push the elbow back into the normal, normal position. So after the reduction, we can do a further image for him. And here we can see uh, the patient have a concentric joint with disruption of the lateral structure and medial structures. But because of the re relative stable elbow joint, we don't have to do surgery for this kind of patient. And after six months, the patient regained his full elbow range of motion and a healed medial structure and lateral structures. But not every patient can have a stable joint after reduction. Here I'm going to present a 20 years of male with a dislocated elbow joint. And we also try to cross reduce the elbow joint at emergency room. But six weeks later, the patient visited our clinic with a chronic dislocated elbow. In this situation, the fibrotic tissue will occupy within the elbow joint and makes it impossible to do a close reduction. So we have to, to do an open reduction with the lateral ulnar collateral ligament contraction and repair of the medial structures. And after four months, the patient has a stable elbow joint with a functional elbow range of motion. You can see she has a 20 degree extension and 135 degree flexion. And the next one will be the complex dislocations. And a complex dislocation means a dislocated elbow joint with associated fractures. And the fracture is usually located over coronary process and the radial head. So 
Here I'm going to demonstrate a dislocation elbow joint with fracture of the coronary process. And after reduction, we also arrange a further image for him, and we can see the patient have a subluxation of the elbow joint. And this kind of instability usually comes from the disruption of lateral ulnar collateral ligament and the anterior structures. So traditionally, we usually do a double incision for this kind of patient with a lateral incision on the to address the lateral structures and a medial incision to, uh, to repair the coronoid process and the medial structures. But owing to the advancement of the arthroscope techniques and instruments, we can do an arthroscopic approach for these kind of patients now. <clears throat> and first of all, we are going to put the patient in a lateral cubital position, expose the elbow joints, and we only need three to four portals to address all of lesions around the elbow joint. And the first step, we are going from the soft spot portal directly into the anterior elbow joint because of the instability. And after the deployment of the hematoma around the elbow joint, we can see a fracture part of the coronary process and the anterior capsule. So the next step will be to repair the anterior capsules. And we have to pass the shooter limb into the appropriate position of the anterior capsule. And then we are going to make two bone tunnels from the posterior cortex of the polycranon. So we can pass the shooter limb into the bone tunnels and fix the coronary process and the anterior capsule. And the last step is also the most important one is the repair of the lateral anocleator ligament. And during this arthroscopic approach, we can see the detachment of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament from the lateral f condyle. And in this condition, we will put an anchor into the center of the lateral f condyle and repair the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So after repair, the patient can have a full range of motion infection in section up and full range of motion of pronation and supination. So he can get a full recovery of his function with, with a minimal invasive approach. And the next topic I'm going to talk about the overuse related injuries. And the overuse related injuries usually happens in overhead athletes, especially a baseball pitcher. So the three mechanisms of a baseball pitcher can simply divide it into six phases, including wind up phase, stride, arm cupping, acceleration, deceleration, and the final follow through. The most common happen injuries usually happens in the arm cocking phase and deceleration phase. And for the elbow injuries, it usually comes from a stress and repetitive microtrauma. And this figure here demonstrates a distraction force of a middle elbow and a compression force of a lateral elbow during a pitching, pitching phase. <clears throat> and this will make different kinds of injury patterns here. So today I'm going to introduce two kinds of overuse related injuries. The first one will be the vulgus extension overload, and the second one will be the osteochondritis discans <coughs> of capitalin. So the vulgus extension overload is usually results from an excessive shear force on medial aspect of olecranon tip and olecranon fossa. With a posterior extension overload and medial tension at medial collateral ligaments. <coughs> This kind of injury is usually happened <coughs> during arm deceleration phase. The patient is usually complained about <coughs> pain and loss of terminal elbow extension. So in this case, we can see a uh, anterior osteophyte and posterior osteophyte in the CD image. And we can, because of this, we can image the patient will have loss of extension due to posterior osteophyte over olecranon tip and olecranon fossa. And he will also lose of his flexion because of the osteophyte over the trochlea. And <clears throat> in this case, we are going to do an arthroscopic surgery for him because the minimal invasive surgery will make the patient faster return to sports. Usually, this kind of patient can return to his sports within four to eight weeks. And we only need three to four portals to address all of these lesions. And the target of this kind of arthroscopic approach is to remove the loose bodies 
endocrine spurs. And after removal of these kind of spurs, the range of motion can improve to 15 degree extension and 135 degree flexion. And the next topic, I'm going to introduce the OCD lesion of Cape Talon. <clears throat> and OCD lesion is, means a separation of articular cartilage and subchondral bone. And this kind of OCD lesion is usually comes from a repetitive compression type of injury. The Cape Talon has a unique vascular supply with a water shell around the, the Cape Talon. A repetitive microtrauma will compromise the vascular supply around the Cape Talon. And finally, it will, make, it will compromise the healing potential and the cartilage will detach from the, from the Cape Talon. And this kind of OCD lesion is usually occurs after 10 years old. The prognosis is based on physical status <clears throat> for the early stage lesion. The rest is gold standard for treatment. But in the last stage, we usually need a surg surgical intervention, but the outcomes is variable. And here I'm going to demonstrate a 14 years old picture. The, 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 the image on our left side is the normal, normal image, normal x-ray. On the right side, you can see a detached cartilage from, from the lateral structures. So the MI is also confirmed a OCD lesion over, over the capitalin. The patient only has a 50 degree range of motion arc with 40 degree extension and 90 degree flexion. The main goal of this arthroscopic surgery is to remove the loose bodies and detach fragments and will make some microfracture over the lesion to have to obtain a breathing surface. So in this kind of patient, we, we only need three portals to, to for a faster recovery. And first of all, we are going to debris the hypertrophic synovium. And after the debridement, we can see a detached cartilage on, on, on the anterior elbow joint. And after debridement, we are going to make some microfractures over the lesion, over the lesion, in order to make a breathing surface to regenerate its healing potential. And after, after surgery, four months later, the patient has healed later structures and a range of motion. Here, you can see the patient can retain his full range of motion and he returned to sports in one and a half months. So that's my present presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Professor Wu. Um, it's interesting to see that you have many elbow cases in the young patient. Um, I don't think there are many for, from our setting over here in our clinic, but yeah, all the same, it's interesting to know. Um, for our next um, speaker, our last topic would be about uh, sports medicine and comprehensive treatment of shoulder disorder. For this talk, I'd like to invite Associate Professor Wen Yi Chao, who is a very experienced orthopedic surgeon in Chango Memorial Hospital. And he is also a very prolific uh, researcher who has published over um, 50 papers, if I'm not mistaken, from his long CV. Um, without further ado, uh, please welcome Associate Professor Chow. Yes. So can I start uh, now? Yes, please. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm, I'm Dr. Cho from Gaoshan Changke Memorial Hospital. Today I'm going to present about the treatment regarding the shoulders, common shoulder disorders and uh, how do we set up our sports medicine care in this 15 minutes. We have a limit, limited time, so I want to make it quick. And thanks for the attendance of this meeting. Okay, I want to skip this personal introduction. And uh, I just, I, I'm uh, participating in the national team care for more than 10 years. And this is a picture I take from uh, Tokyo to uh, Tokyo last year in Olympic game. And it's a great experience to deal with the 
our uh, national athletes. I take care of them for more than 10 years. So I got some experience that maybe I can share in this time. And here is my uh, uh, specialty. Uh, the majority of my practice is about shoulder, elbow, and knee surgery. And the study focused on the uh, shockwave therapy. And then I uh, we established a comprehensive post-medicine care in Changke Memorial Hospital of Kaohsiung. And the first topic I want to talk about is the rotator cuff lesion. As we know that rotator cuff lesion is a very common shoulder injuries in the population, not only in athletes, but the elderly people. And rotator cuff com comprise the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and a subsularis tendon in the front. And as you can see in this, in this picture, this is the, the rotator cuff tendon in the cadaveric demonstration, as you can see, the whole cuff <clears throat> cover the human head. And so that when muscle when the muscle contract, the human head will rotate and it would make the shoulder move. And this is a closer picture as so you can see from a cadaveric specimen. And the cuff tear is a very common, in common injury in the, in the lesion for, for the elderly. And the most uh, uh, pathological patholo uh, change is the uh, intrinsic is intrinsic change, which means the tendon became weaker and the quality became poor in the degenerating status. And the another factor is the uh, is tracing factor. We would call it maybe we have the bone spur on around the shoulder, so that the rotator cuff will become more fragile, so that the, uh, the 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 spur will make the tendon tear. So the intrinsic degeneration and extrinsic spur. Is you was uh, recognized as a common cause for a rotator cuff tear, and it, it in it affects about thirty to forty percent of the, of the populations. In the early stage, is a biological act, act uh, active. So if we can protect it very well, it will lead to spontaneous recovery. But usually, the tear will be chronic and is unable to respond to the to the spontaneous healing. So. It, it will, and most of the time, it become disorganized and, and the conductive tissue and become fatty change and the fibrous tissue will cover the tendon. And then it will be result in a poor tendon healing and become tear progress. And actually there are two types of rotator cuff tear. The first one is a partial tear. And the second is the uh, full thickness tear. And as you can see in this picture, we can see we have uh, articular side tear, we have bursa side tear, and we also have the in, in, uh, internal impingement. And all these are the uh, uh, subtypes of the partial, artic, uh, partial thickness tear of the, of the rotator cuff. And in a study that we know that in the symptom, symptomatic partial thickness tear, 82% will increase in size, which means if you have partial thickness tear and we, the tear size will increase to years later, in, it takes about 82%. So uh, sometimes even in a partial thickness tear, you have to deal with aggressive attitude. And when it becomes the full thickness tear, yeah, you need to do the surgery. And traditionally we use the open surgery, but nowadays arthroscope surgery become the mainstay. Although the study shows that in the long term, the, the mini open or open surgery is almost at the same functional result as osteoarthritis surgery, but as we know that the minimal invasive procedure will have the shorter recovery and uh, a functional recovery. And we have various types of repair techniques, but the ideal repair, we have to restore the footprint of the contact area. We have to have a, a appropriate compression of the tendon on the footprint and minimize the bone tendon interface so that the healing is, will be complete. And here I want to show is the uh, partial, the first type one subsularis tear. As you can see, it's a, it's a small tear here and we can do the repair in the oscilloscope. And in this picture, we see a larger tear of the subsularis tendon and we can use the oscilloscope technique to have a very good re repair and it's the more advanced subsularis tear. It shows a, a common called a coma sign. 
is a complete tear of subsalar tendon. And after adequate release, we can still have a very good recover, uh, uh, repair using arthroscopic techniques. And, here, and this is a more extensive tear like this. And we can use the arthroscopic technique to have a full recovery. And for the supraspinatus tendon, and in this picture is a small tear, and we, we can use some stitches to have the full recovery, and that will have the good healing. And this is intrasubstance tear. So no matter how big it, the, the tendon is, we can use the arthroscope technique to have the full recovery. And for the medial or large uh, tear, uh, reported said that the a double row always have a good result. And here's a demonstration of how we deal with the double row tech, double row repair. This is the picture after a repair using the double row techniques. And another, uh, another uh, alternative or double repair, we call it a transosa equivalence. It can create a planar compression force on a torn tendon on the torn tendon. So it, after repair, as you can see on the right-hand side, is a, a, a planar compression of the tendon on the uh, footprint so that the tendon healing, will, tendon will have a good tendon healing. And sometimes we have deal with the tendon with the very, very poor quality. And in the before, Dr. Wu and I just published a paper talks about a, a functional result was, was relative worse in a patient with chronic uh, kidney disease. And sometimes when we deal with a tendon like this, you can see it had the denomination tear. So we have, we have to deal with layer by layer, layer by layer repair. We, we repair the medial row first, and then we repair the lateral, we, we repair the, uh, the, the outer layer so that we can have a full cover, full cover of, uh, the, of the tendon. So in this picture, as you can see, is a denominated tear. The tendon becomes split into two layers. So we repair layer by layer. This is medial. After the medial repair, we do a dual layer suture bridge. As you can see, you can see the bridge, suture bridge tendon, suture material here have a, a large, strong compression force on the tendon and the patient recover very well. And that's another denomination tear through the medial repair and the lateral repair. So even if it's a big tear, we can have a good, very good recover. But sometimes we have to deal with the tendon like torn like this. You can see it's a very, very we call it massive rotator cuff tear. The tendon you can see here is on the biceps tendon. For the, uh, the, the rotator cuff tendon, it's almost gone, diminished. In a situation like this, traditionally we can do the conductive treatment, we can do it a uh, debridement, we can do a tuberosity or partial repair. But now we have uh, the, the tech surgical so technique. In the in the beginning, we used uh, in the case like this, we used a, a dermis graft like this. We can have a using the open technique, we can have a full recovery. As you can see here, this is the this is the a, a graft. It's a six week, uh, it's a three months after the graft and the graft healing very well. And it's in the, in the, it's about five years ago, we, we used a, a mini open technique to, to do the, the graft reconstruction. But now we converted all this technique into the arthroscopic technique to, to get a, a reconstruction of the a massive rotator cuff tear. As you can see on the right hand side, it's a full recovery after the uh, uh, supraspinated, uh, super, uh, uh, superior capsule reconstruction. And you can see this patient, they can have full recovery. But sometimes the patient progressed to the cafeteria thrombosy. As you can see, this old gen this gentleman okay. can fail, okay. fail to, to okay. elevate his shoulder okay. on the left side. Okay. And now, after the, sorry, after the reverse shoulder replacement, as you can see on the left hand side, sorry. 
he can for elevation of his shoulder right now. Um, reverse solar shoulder is a solution for the massive rotator cuff tear which advanced the uh, glenohumeral joint arthritis. And it's called a selfish procedure for the failed fracture management. As you can see on the left hand side, this, this lady cannot elevate her shoulder because of a failed uh, proximal humerus fracture, fracture fixation. And after a replacement of the uh, reverse total shoulder, she had near full elevation of her shoulder. And this, this 35 year old lady, he failed to elevate his right shoulder, almost looks like complete uh, uh, shoulder paralysis. And because of the failed hemi shoulder osteoplasty after the plasma humerus fracture. So we do the replacement. One year, late, one year later, she can elevate his shoulder in a full range of motion. And, and another common lesion is the uh, labyrinth lesion. And this is mostly a uh, sports injury related injury. And as, as you can see, the labyrinth tear here, uh, this is a uh, small labyrinth here. And here is the tear of the slap lesion. And this kind of patient, they have shoulder catching the pop sum and the pain while overhead activity, shoulder weakness. And sometimes it will loss its throwing velocity control uh, and, and, and the ball control in inadequate daily activity performance. And here is the, here is the MI slide showed. You can see the slap lesion around here. Sorry, using the hair. And most of uh, shoulder injury like this is the player with the overhead activity. So that if you're in your country, we have uh, overhead, act, overhead uh, elite athletes, maybe have the risk of a slap lesion. And in the beginning, we can do a conservatory, but uh, most of the time when it fail, you need to do the surgical management. And this is an intraoperative picture. You can see the, the severe tear of the labyrinth in, in the joint, like this. And after repair, we, we, can, we can almost fix it back. And this is a very famous baseball player in Taiwan and he returned to sports and hit a home run after the surgery. And this is another, uh, is a, an, uh, another case who is a, 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 a canoe, canoe athlete. He fell into the water while he uh, doing the training. And so you can see the tear here is it's very complicated. We call it slap three tear. It's a called a back end tear. And after repair, also scope repair, can do a com complete repair of the labyrinth. And on the right hand side is a picture. It's a it's a video. One year after the surgery, she returned to the training with full uh, full training without any limitation. So in the finally one, uh, in, in the comprehensive sports medicine care, we establish our teamwork. Not only the injury treatment, but the doping control, nutrition, psychology, sports science, and medical resources, and athletic trainer. So we establish a team, cover the orthopedic, physical therapist, rehabilitation, doping control, radiologist. We have systemic support in the psychological and we, sorry, we have Chinese medicine and athletic trainer. So all this was to focus on our athletes and the patients. We hope them to return to the, to the uh, 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 sports field as soon as possible and as good as possible. And this is a related uh, articles that we published you know, all regarding about the sports injury and the sports science. And this is our sports performance training center. Uh, it looks like a gym. Yeah, it, it, sometimes it's, it, it, it is a dream, but we have the motion capture system here. And th this is the motion, one of the motion capture system. And this is the, our training facility. And in here, this, uh, the athletes can do the training. We call it post-operative training and rehabilitation so that we can, we can keep monitoring, uh, monitor the recovery status of the, our athletes. And we introduce a very, very special training, uh, training uh, equipment. We call it a uh, beginning movement load training. We would have 
a special relaxation, lengthening, shortening uh, muscle, uh, muscle activity sequence. It can also prevent the muscle con contraction. And it have a special rotation on long axis at the extension and flexion of our upper and lower extremities. And this is also a very special equipment for the elite athletes like Ichiro Suzuki, he's a very famous baseball player in, in Japan and in America. And we did a study in proof that the, in this uh, particular uh, equipment, we can have a superior training of our supraspinatus tendon. And here is a, our whole picture. We, and in this, our sports medicine care, once the athletes had an injury, we can do the treatment. Before the injury, we can do the prevention using our motion analysis system. We use the hyperbaric oxygen for the non-conservative treatment for the muscular strain, or we can use our uh, regenerating therapy. If surgery is needed, we can do every kind of soft surgical uh, soft tissue reconstruction. And after a surgery, rehab training will, will be conducted in our sports performance training center. And after that, the sports, the athletes can return to their to their sports field. And the, our, our have a uh, 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 very co a good cooperation with our uh, government uh, bureau, like uh, Kaohsiung uh, Sports, Sports Bureau. We have very good relationship with our amateur athletes, including soccer, baseball, volleyball. And I, I did participate in the uh, athletes care in our national sports center, training center. We have a very good cooperation with the profession, uh, professional baseball, but baseball team and uh, the international me uh, medical care. We cover the uh, Korea baseball team and that do the, when they do the training in Taiwan. We can do a, we supply our medical service and not only Korea but also China. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the listening, and this is my brief introduction of, of this topic. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Chow, for your introduction to your sports performance center um, and also some uh, insight into your patient's uh, management as far as uh, rotator cuff injuries are concerned. Um, now, I think it's the time for question and answer session. Um, I wonder if there's any, are there any questions from the chat box? or um, anyone uh, who is attending this um, webinar would like to just on your mic to uh, raise any questions to any of our speakers today it, it, it's okay to have uh, a question regarding sports medicine in malaysia yeah sure any is open um anyone can raise any question uh, we uh, I, in fact, I would probably have one for you yourself. I think Prof Naha is also eager to pose some questions. Yes, we can do our discussion here. Okay, uh, please go ahead, Professor Chow. I think uh, you wanted to ask something. Yes, I, I, I wonder how, how do you do have the cooperation with your uh, national team? Like, I think that a soccer is the most popular sports in, in your country. Maybe soccer is the most popular sports in your country. So how do you cooperate? What's the... Uh, What's the protocol of the uh, a collaboration with the uh, soccer team in your in your in your country? Yeah, um, we don't call it soccer. We call it football. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know what we understand. Okay. Um, of course, uh, we have National Sport Institute where that's the body of um, what we call that any form of collaboration with the any form of uh, clubs, football clubs, but in Malaysia, we have what we call um, FAM, what we call it? Um, Malaysian um, uh, Football Association, an old association of Malaysia, and which have a team of so-called sports um, as a team. We have two, two or three of our colleagues, sports uh, physician uh, is in the team of National Football Association. Uh, of course, each state will have their own, uh, what we call that, sport physician. So currently, we have uh, uh, not all, uh, some of the team members we have our colleagues uh, involved with. But uh, at the moment, like um, is is actually um, 
um, how to get involved directly, it, it, it's it's like um, through a national sport institute. Yeah, uh, we ourselves are fortunate. We have uh, involved. We are actually currently get involved with uh, Slango. Slango is actually a state, uh, one of the state in the country, and one of the strong uh, what we call that uh, team, uh, football team in 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 Malaysia. So uh, we have one of our graduate uh, sport physicians uh, in the team. That's where we have some kind of link, working collaboration. So indirectly, we have somebody. So in a way that if you want to to get linked to this, uh, I will call that uh, club or association, you need to have some kind of a link where you can collaborate with them. So not directly. So in a way, there's some kind of, of political things also involvement. Lah. <laughs> but yes, uh, football, uh, one of it. Also, other, 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 what we call that, um, other sporting like badminton. Uh, I'm sure Taiwan also one of the strongest, uh, uh, what we call the opening for Malaysia in badminton and uh, some other sports like, uh, you know, like uh, diving, swimming, where, uh, 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 most of the athletes, elite athletes, will be uh, under National Sport Institute. But most of the time, National Sport Institute, whenever that they require uh, uh, members, uh, because of the numbers, they have very limited numbers, so they will communicate with us and get us involved uh, in whichever event, a sporting event, uh, ongoing event in the country or internationally. Okay, um, I think Pro yes, Professor Chow. Um, does that answer your question or your further um, queries? Uh, Professor Noha, I think you have got a question just now. You're about to raise your hand. No, you did not. Okay, I was mistaken. I thought he was about to ask a question. Um, Otherwise, I would be curious on how would, um, as far as I understand, Changong Memorial Hospital is a hospital and it's not a university. But I am um, impressed on how you incorporate a sports performance center in your university. Could you please share? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that's a very good question. As you know, in the hospital, um, it's really not easy to establish like you know, a space like a dream in the hospital. It's not easy because I think we, is our, our, we are very lucky. We have a, a, a very, we get a very full support from our superintendent and our, our chief leader in, in Lincoln. It, she support a lot about our activity in the sports medicine care so that we can create a sports performance center like that. Because, you know, as a, for a sportsman, especially for a orthopedic surgeon, yes, we focus on a surgery. We want to, we want to repair any torn tendon or a, a, a ruptured ligament. But what can we do after the repair? Rehabilitation is very important. So if we have the space, a very, uh, not only rehab, but including the concept of training in here, so that we can uh, we can make our surgical result better. So, because of support and uh, of course our uh, enthusiasm, so we 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 create a space a space like that, uh, a space like this, and uh, we found it's very useful to to get to uh, to provide a, a medical service. For the not only a patient but the elite elite athletes, because we have to deal with a lot of professional baseball player with a lot of our national national level athletes, so they need more. They have more uh, demand, especially the functional demand. Uh, functional demand. So, in this in this place, we can get a very good uh, rehabilitation and training result after the surgical repair. Of course, not only the surgery. If if the patient or the athlete has a, 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 non, a, a, a lesion that did not need the surgery, 
but you still can have the training in our facility that can get a, a, a full recovery. And we also apply various kind of uh, regenerative uh, a, a treatment like a shock wave, like a, a, a PRP, et cetera, et cetera. And so that with combination of these modalities that can help us to help our, our athletes return to the sports field as good and as good as possible. Yes, thanks for your question. Okay, thank you, Prof Chow, for your answer. Um, can I just confirm if there's Can I question? ask one uh, question? So I'm be curious also. Uh, like most, um, uh, you have uh, direct so-called access to athletes. Yeah. Uh, uh, does at your place uh, you need to have um, uh, like centralized where like national sporting uh, institute organized uh, organization where all right all athletes need to go through there first or they can choose anywhere like to Changgung hospital okay for our net for our national athletes of course they can choose the doctor they want to see of course but uh, in our national training uh, our national uh, training center sports training center they have we have they have a clinic inside and i uh, we have several doctors regularly get into the regularly have the medical service in that clinic but that's just a clinic we we cannot do any advanced treatment or examination so just like uh, for example i i'm a doctor inside the uh, national sporting training center so if the some of some kind of a badminton player they have the ankle problem they come to see me i found oh maybe you need an mri and I will refer this patient back to our hospital to do the examination. And once if they need a surgery, of course, we can do it step by step. So uh, I think the connection of the, 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 the sports center and the hospital is the doctor. It's the doctor. And the doctor must uh, take in. I think that this doctor must have the enthusiasm about in the sports medicine care. And uh, you need to, in some kind of, you, you are, the doctor is just a bridge between the uh, uh, sports training center and the hospital. You're also a bridge between the professional team and the hospital. Uh, the hospital. So once we can uh, establish the, uh, uh, a comprehensive, uh, a very good uh, uh, care uh, uh, tract on, in our hospital, I, I think that we can get a very good service for the athletes. Good to know that we are not so much difference between uh, Taiwan and uh, us uh, here in Malaysia. So the system is basically about more or less the, uh, similar, uh, only that maybe the Changgong Hospital more uh, advanced in terms of uh, managing the athletes over there. So maybe we need to somehow pay a visit over there looking uh, look at, look at what uh, investment advancement that you have that may we can uh, get uh, learn uh, learn and uh, work together in future thank you um andrew is there any other question from the chat box no okay so um i don't think we have any questions from the chat box um and uh, I have not seen any hands being raised. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, we should call it a end, uh, end the session today. But um, I suppose we have a lot to share and learn from each other. It's just uh, probably we need an, another separate meeting to learn how we set up the center. I'm really impressed with the way um, your hospital has managed to find a space for the sports uh, center. And also probably compare notes on the types of injuries that we are seeing uh, on each side and uh, how probably you can emulate each other's uh, the strong points as far as the um, uh, administrative side of sports medicine is concerned. I think we all agree that that is a very big stumbling block when sports medicine has to work with uh, various um, authorities. Um, with that, uh, thank you for um, participating in our webinar today. Looking forward to uh, speak again soon. Um, 
Is there anything else, um, Andrew? That no? okay then. Uh, thank you. Very, uh, thank you everyone for joining us as well. And there is a Google form for uh, just just for the Malaysian um, or uh, participants that uh, they need to fill up a Google uh, attendance form to probably claim their CPD. I think our points. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.